Hello there, everybody. I hope you've all had a wonderful work week. So do you remember Cliff's Notes? Yeah, if you do, you're probably near my age and you remember that iconic yellow and black jacketed book that covered all manner of literary works. Cliff's Notes were summaries that basically it gave you the gist of a book or a play and usually some short summary of the themes or the symbolism represented in that literary work. Cliff's Notes were the way you could get around reading the actual book or the play for school and, you know, get the general meaning of what was going on. Fun fact, Cliff's Notes was started in 1958. There was a whole line of Shakespearean summaries. Now, the critique of Cliff's Notes were just that around the idea of cheating, that the surface-level analysis was often kind of lacking in terms of depth and that many of the nuanced and true themes of the work were missed as a result. It was kind of considered cheating. So, now, the company always did promote the reading of the actual work, and it viewed Cliff's Notes as a companion study guide for the work, not a replacement for actually reading the work. But, you know, that wasn't really the way that we used them. You know, we just didn't use them that way. Yeah, well, in the world of AI, there's a new hot version of Cliff's Notes, and it's called Notebook LM from Google, and it's taking the business world by a storm as the hottest new use case in AI. So, I thought I'd take a look. Does a rose by any other name smell as sweet? Is Notebook LM the 2020s version of Cliff's Notes? Or would Notebook LM actually say it a little differently? They might say... But we have to remember, they're tools. Right. Powerful tools, but they need to be used thoughtfully, strategically. So the question for you is, how can you use tools like Notebook LM not just to work faster, but to make smarter, more informed decisions? Thanks for diving in with us. Catch you next time. Yeah, maybe this is going to put me out of a job. <laughs> Let's roll. Hello, everybody. Robert Gross here with What's New in Marketing. It is about what's new in marketing, but most importantly, it's something important in marketing that we think may help you become a better leader. And if we can help you or your team with content marketing services, and that includes training, consultation, ongoing implementation of your content marketing program, Get on over to contentmarketinginstitute.com, fill out that form, let's set up a Zoom call, let's actually just talk about it. All right, well, if you haven't noticed, your LinkedIn feed has been swamped lately with people talking about Google's Notebook LM. The new product, which like most things from Google is still in quote experimental end quote phase, was originally billed as a note-taking app. It launched in the U.S. in December of last year and is just coming up on its one-year anniversary. In the intervening 10 months, it's added a ton of new features that have continued to create new fans of the platform. The way I'd sum it all up is that these new features are offered as a way for you to talk to and get various summaries of documents, videos, audio files, all that you might upload into the system. It reminds me a very much more like sophisticated and advanced version of Cliff's Notes which would take literary works and, of course, break them down into those consumable chunks or summaries that you could read to get, you know, the general idea of what's in the bigger work. So once you upload a document, or source as they call it, you can then have Notebook LM summarize it, give you a study guide for it, critique it, including grammar and even some level of content, or just ask questions of the document in a chat-style interface itself. But the feature released in September of this year, that's the one that's got everybody frothy, and it's one of the outputs from that is what they call an audio overview. It can output your document as a friendly podcast-style audio file. The AI hosts, a man and a woman, that are unnamed but sound young and energetic, while well, they give you a casual overview in a back-and-forth manner with, well, to put it in kind of a professional sports metaphor, the male AI sort of providing much of the play-by-play -play and the woman giving sort of color or insight into what's going on and either of them asking questions or providing answers to each other. It's incredibly impressive, especially as the technology adds, it's one of my favorite new words, disfluencies to the speech. That is, the technology adds these, you know, sort of false starts, filler words like uh and ah uh, and, you know, like, and all those instances where in natural language makes it sound a bit more human. But really simply, they sound like two young people chatting about your source document and what it all means. Now, there have been a few people proclaiming that they can automate the idea of business podcasts with these AI personalities as their hosts will ostensibly, you know, automate the entire content creation process. But is this the best use case for this, or is there something different at play here that can actually add to the usefulness of what this technology can provide? 
It's kind of hard for me to understand in a world where anyone can do this, why we would value someone else doing it. In other words, when the only creative input to the podcast is what documents you're curating, it kind of seems like a pretty thin mode of differentiation and value. But as I've been experimenting with it, I think there's something else that fits within the broader themes of what I've been talking about lately when it comes to generative AI. And that brings us back to the Cliff's Notes metaphor. There is no doubt that the technology is incredibly impressive. And I want to make clear that I'm really blown away by how easy and natural this is as a tool to quote unquote talk to my documents. But to test it out, I've been trying a few things. For example, I uploaded a copy of our latest B2B content marketing research, which is going to be released very soon. And we're still working on the analysis bit of it, so it got me thinking. So I gave it the straight research, a fairly big bucket of numbers and reporting on those numbers, and but no hints as to what we thought about those numbers. And this is where I wanted to test the results. What kind of insights would it give? I asked it to write a summary, and it was, as you would expect, very straightforward, and it basically gave me a nice summary of all the research, breaking it down to about two pages of bullet points, just the main research topics and the results. But in that summary, it also wrote some key takeaways and actionable insights. All right. Well, at first glance, they seemed really impressive. But, you know, once you start to peel back those very impressive languages assemblies, well, you kind of realize they really aren't all that insightful or wise key takeaways or actionable insights. They're kind of what you'd expect the key takeaways would be if you were a college student that didn't have any expertise in the topic and had simply just read the sort of highlights of the results in a book. In other words, key actions for our B2B content marketing report included things like prioritize strategy and goal setting and embrace data-driven decision-making and invest in technology and training. That sounds nice and the words are well put together, but it would be the equivalent after reading a report about the best practices of how to bake a cake, the key action items start with, start with fresh ingredients and make sure you mix everything well and ensure your oven is working. So, okay, how about just asking Notebook LM about the one key takeaway that I should get as a marketer from reading this report? Well, there, Notebook LM couldn't seem to give me just one. It just, you know, it can't resist itself, which makes sense given that it's built to provide summaries, but it gave me three, one of which was, quote, top performing B2B marketers attribute their success to a deep understanding of their target audience and the creation of high quality content. Again, sounds good. But coming back to our cake metaphor, after reading the best practices and cake marketing report, well, it's the equivalent of saying the best bakers attribute their success to the care they put into learning how to bake a cake and the creation of high quality cakes. It kind of just sort of comments or summarizes itself. So, okay, let's go back to those summaries and the audio overview for a moment, because that's the most exciting aspect of this technology. I had the technology provide me a podcast style audio overview and it dutifully created an eight minute overview of our research. The results, again, incredibly impressive, but again, no real insight, just the overview of the results with each of the hosts commenting that, yeah, good quality content is hard to make and wow, B2B marketers are frustrated at the quality of their results. So this mimics what I've been seeing from most of the generative AI types of solutions. And honestly, it's what they're built to do. Recognize patterns, summarize those patterns, and give you the most probabilistic answer. And this is the lesson we can all learn. It's all plot, no story. Generative AI is fantastic at recognizing those patterns, summarizing, structuring, providing the what happened part of any story. It's very much like the 21st century version of Cliff's Notes. What it lacks is any of that magic that happens when a human can combine their experience with an ability to look beyond the what happened and start to derive or assign meaning to it. So two thoughts here. The first is, now this doesn't diminish the value of Notebook LM. It just simply reminds us where the potential value is in this type of tool. If I'm looking for the Cliff's Notes or summary of what a document literally says, it can be extraordinarily helpful. In other words, if I want the eight-minute audio version of what a 50-page corporate earnings report says, or a research report, or a technical document, or even source code, or anything like that, I just want to get a summary understanding it, it's truly valuable. It saves time. Like Cliff's Notes, it can be that study guide that we have time for. But the first thought lives in tension with this second thought. And the second thought is that caution that the Cliff's Notes always made, which is the valuable friction of the work itself. 
Yeah, valuable friction is what I'm calling it. The valuable friction of us actually reading or consuming or identifying meaning in the work itself. We have to recognize that for some things, it will be better for us to read the original and go through that longer process so that we might connect that unobvious dot to use our experience, our empathy, our creativity, our knowledge, our wisdom collectively to the work itself. That's where actual valuable insight may come, and it may not just be found if you don't have the entire work to read from. Take, for example, this. One of my favorite poems is The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. I asked for the summary from Notebook LM, and it gave me largely what Cliff's Notes would have summarized for the poem. Then I asked it, what's the major takeaway from that poem? And Google Notebook LM, well, it gave me the same lesson that you've seen on millions of speeches, graduation speeches, hundreds of television commercials and business books. They've all concluded that, quote unquote, taking the road less traveled can lead to a more unique and fulfilling life. Except that's not what the poem is about at all. Unless you read the summaries, then of course that is what the poem seems to be about, the conventional wisdom. The problem, or friction, if you like that better, is that if you actually read the poem carefully, thoroughly, and multiple times, you start to slowly realize that this isn't the point at all. The title, by the way, is The Road Not Taken, not the road that I took. In other words, it's about what the author didn't do, not what he did do. And the roads, as Frost says very clearly in the poem, are largely identical, even saying that both roads are worn exactly the same, and that there's no difference between the two. Further, Frost says that in the future, he'll be telling this story with a sigh, meaning he's not necessarily happy about the choice of either taking the one less traveled or not taking the one more traveled. He then goes on to leave us with an ambiguous, that has made all the difference. In other words, the poem itself is a commentary that the life choices are what we make of them. There is no right answer whether you choose one or the other. It's in the difference you make after choosing. So this new technology is amazing. Let's bring us to that technology, our wisdom, and read it multiple times. It's not a crutch to save us from the friction of trying to make meaning out of complexities and complications to our ideas. It is rather a companion that can help us perhaps move us more fluidly from idea to idea and spend the times on the ones that we really want to matter. That's our choice, the fork in the road that we choose. And it's a few minutes of what's new in marketing. Remember, it's your story to tell. You know, choose the right road and then make it a friction-filled one and then go tell it well. I'll see you next week.